So welcome, bienvenidos to today's core coffee chat, which is the last in a three-part series about preparing for proposals. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your hosts today. And today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now, and she'll also translate your written comments and questions in the chat. And soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation, which is provided by Stella Lauerman. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Nicole Young, who's gonna give us a quick overview of CORE. Thanks, Nicole. So again, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And we encourage everyone to think of it as both a funding model or a way to um, distribute resources and funding, as well as a broader movement or collective effort to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in our county. And CORE has evolved over several years based on input and insights that we've gathered uh, over the years from many partners in local government, philanthropy, nonprofits, and many community groups. And so over the years, this collaborative process has led to the core mission and vision statements that you see on this slide where equity is really front and center uh, in both of those statements. And again, this, this notion of that we do this together through collective action, we're striving for safe, healthy communities, equitable opportunities for all to thrive, and that we share the responsibility for uh, achieving that vision. And on the next slide, you'll see what we call the core conditions for health and well being. And this is a really central piece of the core framework uh, because when we say equitable health and well being, we mean that we want to get to a place where all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well-being, and that people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, or any of those other ways that we often think of social identities. And so, when we think of CORE as both a funding model and a broader movement towards collective impact, really CORE provides us a framework and some common language to better align our priorities, our programs, our policies and funding and results around a set of community-wide goals. And then we can work together to create these core conditions for health and well-being. And equity is at the center of this diagram to continuously remind us that we have to examine and address our individual, our organizational, and systemic beliefs and practices and structures that perpetuate the very inequities we are so determined to eliminate. And you'll hear a lot more about the core conditions and the core framework um, uh, in upcoming Core Institute events. Uh, and so events like today's core coffee chat and other trainings or workshops or learning opportunities that we host through the core Institute um, become ways that we can, again, continuously build our shared knowledge and skills. Uh, so think of the core Institute as the learning arm of the core investments initiative. This is really our space and opportunity to offer an array of training, technical assistance, capacity building and other learning opportunities for people across all different sectors, not just nonprofit organizations, but really we try to have this be a place where no matter what type of organization or what area or focus your work is on, that again, we can come here to build shared knowledge, skills, and the systems needed to fulfill that collective vision of an equitable, thriving, resilient community. So in our time together today, we're going to share ideas about how to prepare for grant proposals. Um, so we're not today, we're not talking about any specific funding process. Uh, these are really things that are uh, good to be thinking about, preparing for, looking into, talking about with your colleagues, your coworkers, so that when the time comes, when you've got to <clears throat> hit the ground running to prepare uh, a proposal for a specific funding process, that you hopefully have some of these tools and ideas uh, ready to work with. 
So we do want to encourage you to share your comments and questions in the chat uh, throughout the way. We will have time at the end to address specific questions. Uh, and then after today's event, we'll share links to the video recordings and bilingual slides in a follow-up email. It usually takes us a few days at least to prepare the videos and ensure all of our uh, slides and everything is um, ADA or Americans with Disabilities Act accessible and passes all those standards. So sometimes that takes a little extra time. I will go ahead and pass it back to Nicole at this point. Thanks, Nicole. So today we're going to talk about the magic of metrics. And um, as you all know, and some of you mentioned in the chat, the reason you're here is to learn more about how these work. Um, these are a common part of proposals um, and grant writing, but also really useful for, for other kinds of planning activities. And um, if you've been with us for all three sessions or have had a chance to watch the recordings or plan to, our first session on preparing for proposals ahead of time, we talked about some elements of your program and your pitch that can be updated at regular intervals so you could be more prepared for any opportunity that comes up, as, as Nicole just mentioned. In the second one, we talked about different ways to make your case, including an overview of how to frame issues. And both of those are available in English and Spanish on the core website. But today we'll, we'll talk about metrics. We'll go over some tools that can help you identify what you wanna measure, as well as some different ways to collect data and deal with some common data collection challenges. And we'll have some time, as Nicole said, for your questions. So feel free to pose those in the chat throughout today's session. You don't have to wait till the end. Across all three of these proposal prep sessions, including today's, we're highlighting um, theories of change and logic models. And we'll also be offering some more detailed training and technical assistance on those particular tools um, later this summer. And if you hadn't had a chance to attend those earlier sessions, theories of change and logic models are just good ways to clarify what you're proposing to do and why. So they can be really good scaffolding or, or uh, thought process for identifying the metrics that you may wanna track. So there are lots of ways to slice and dice the metrics that we use to measure progress. Some common terms that may be familiar to you from the evaluation world are process measures, and those tend to focus on the actual process of delivering your services and the different activities that might be related to them. And you also may have come across the term outcome measures, which look at the results of your services and activities. Outcome measures may be further divided over time into short, medium, or long-term measures. So they're looking at what's realistic to achieve, let's say a year from now might be a short-term measure, or a few years further down the road, or even in a longer-term uh, time frame, like a decade. And as all of these activities and outcomes hopefully gather some momentum, they should have an impact in the long run, which is the ultimate change that results from your efforts. And that may be described as the impact that you're having. So all of these can be, can be items that you're asked to describe in a grant proposal or evaluation, or that may be part of, let's say a strategic plan for your organization or some other kinds of planning um, documents and um, websites and other ways that you communicate what you're trying to do. One of the um, ways that you may be asked to describe what you're doing is also um, in terms of the specific goals that you have. So you may have heard the terminology of SMART goals. So that's an acronym that stands for specific, measurable, sometimes the A is ambitious or aspirational, and sometimes it's achievable. So there are just some different, different ways to use that A. R usually is for realistic, and T is something to do with time, so time bound. And what we're going to share today is a recent addition to uh, from SMART goals to SMART T goals, um, 
that adds the dimensions of being inclusive and equitable. So this is just a quick example. And again, we'll, we'll do more uh, training in TA about this um, later on, but this is just to give you an overview of how you can take a perfectly fine SMART goal and strengthen it by adding inclusion and equity dimensions. So in this example, which comes from the management center, a, a resource we'll share um, and a, a goals worksheet that they have, um, the example they've provided is building a volunteer team of 100 door-to-door -door canvassers by May. So that's specific. You know exactly what it is. It's measurable. You'll reach your goal of 100 or some other number. It's ambitious or achievable, depending on how hard it is to build that volunteer team. And it's realistic. So maybe you've got a track record that shows that it's a stretch, but it's doable because you've done something like that before. And it's time-based because you're saying you want to finish it by May. But when you add that you're going to focus on recruiting at least 10 people of color first, you've added inclusion and equity. So you've turned it into a smart, smart eagle. And also you've potentially changed the outcome because you're not just recruiting people of color, but you're intending to do so in order to shape the way that you undertake the work itself, which in this case is canvassing. So Gisela will post um, a link to Smarty Goals worksheets that um, we can go over in the Q&A portion as well. And we'll send those out with the video links um, in a few days. But that's just to give you a sense of how those can be expanded. So let's go through an everyday example, just so you can get a little bit more of a sense of the differences between process and outcome metrics. So this is just an everyday example of making dinner. So there's a process that you follow with some steps. These might be different depending on your style, how many people you're feeding, how much time you have to devote to the task, but it's just to give you an idea. So whether you're popping a frozen meal into a microwave or a slicing and dicing and sauteing some delicious ingredients, you'll be doing some kind of prep or planning work like reviewing your recipe or making a grocery list. And then you'll have some follow-up activities that are based on those like prepping your ingredients and preparing them in a certain way. All of those steps which show up as blue on this slide are part of a process that you've broken down into steps that make sense to you. Somebody else might do it differently, but this is your process. And each one of them would have a metric or measure that tells you it's been completed or accomplished. So you've made your list, you've bought your groceries, you've done your prep work, et cetera. And then shown in green on this slide, you wanna see what the outcomes are of all of that effort. So ideally, let's say you've been able to get a reasonably healthy dinner to the table, if that's your intended short-term outcome. Maybe your short-term outcome is a little different, like contribute to the financial viability of my local pizza place. That's perfectly fine. It's just a different way of achieving the same goal, which is to get dinner on the table. So that's the short-term outcome tonight. But what about longer term? Maybe I'm thinking about the fact that my family is fed and reasonably happy with what's been put in front of them. Maybe I'm working on introducing some different meals or trying to adjust a budget or eat less takeout. But whatever it is, the accumulation of the process steps that I've invested in should yield something right away. That's my short-term outcome. And then more later on as time goes by. So that might be my medium term or longer term outcomes. And ultimately, I want to have some greater impact, like my family feeling loved and nurtured because making dinner is my love language or something like that. But this, this is all hypothetical and your mileage may vary. But just to illustrate how process and outcome are linked. So how do we make sure that the strategies that we've got are lined up with the outcomes that we want to achieve? 
If you've attended the two prior proposal prep sessions we described, the first two items on this list, logic models and theories of change, will sound familiar. We'll also be devoting, as I said, some more training and TA time to those tools over the summer if you missed those first two sessions or want additional detail. The other two tools on this list, the core strategies and program outcomes tool and the core continuum of results and evidence were developed as part of the core investments framework that Nicole Young described earlier, but they apply to lots of different initiatives. Um, we'll go over those shortly as well. So let's do a quick logic model refresher. Whether you've worked on them before or just had a recent exposure to them through our core coffee chats or other means, these might look familiar. They're the common components. Um, they're just some sense of the inputs or the assets or resources that you're devoting to your, uh, your program. They're either in place or there's something that you need. Then there's some activities, that's the things that you're undertaking right now. And those have some outputs or immediate results that you can point to, like the number of counseling sessions or a certain number of people trained or reached with your, with your work. And then there are the outcomes that you want to achieve. So short-term, medium-term, long-term, and some changes or impact that you hope will come from those outcomes cumulatively over time. And all of those have some metrics or indicators associated with them that tell you that they're actually happening, um, either in whole or in part. And part of the reason for doing this is to understand whether your intentions and expectations were realistic or not. So if you fall short, that's okay. You can still learn from that. These um, Logic models should work in either direction, reading from left to right or right to left. So you could say, here's what we have in place and what we're doing, and that's closest to your current moment in time. Or you can start it down the road, the ultimate impact we want to achieve side on the right, which could be years away. And it it's just a way to say, here's what we expect to achieve and here's what we've got in place to achieve it and how we get from here to there or working backwards. Here's what we hope to achieve and here's what we need to have in place in order to get there. So again, these are not crystal balls that pre predict the future. They're just your best informed guess about what could happen. And that's why it's a good idea to update them along the way and respond to things that have changed. So alongside logic models, we have theories of change. And this is a slide from our last session on making your case. So both of these theories of change and logic models can help you do that and can help generate the metrics or indicators that you're looking at to gauge your progress. And while there is overlap between the two tools, theories of change and logic models, um, there are some differences. Theories of change are more explicit about the assumptions that are underlying what you're doing. And while both can describe activities, strategies, goals, and the ultimate impact that you want to achieve, logic models typically have a bit more detail about those, as well as more metrics. So just a quick note that everything that we're talking about here, activities, strategies, goals, objectives, outcomes, impact, all of those words might be defined slightly differently by different funders or agencies, or even within your own organization. So the example we just gave about SMART and SMART goals are an example of how a funder might specify what those words stand for um, and how they want you to see it and describe it. And if you are doing something a little differently, that's fine, but just make sure that you've communicated that. So you might want to say, um, you know, the XYZ foundation or agency defines a goal this way, but we think of it more like this, and that's what's reflected in our materials. So just be sure that you have some kind of crosswalk if you're thinking of your um, goals and objectives and strategies differently from the funder that you're applying to. So 
So let's turn now to some of the tools that can give you more specifics about these metrics. Um, so we're gonna highlight a couple of them today, and we'll start with something that's on the DataShare website on the core uh, page within DataShare. And I'm gonna stop the slide share. Gisela's put a link in the chat, but if you wanna follow along, I'm gonna go ahead and do this on my screen as well. So give me just a moment. Switch. Any questions so far? You know, we're, we're moving pretty quickly through this material. Okay, so hopefully you can see this on my screen. Um, the fastest way to get to the results menu, I think, is to go to the local progress page and you see it right here at the top, core results menu. And if you scroll down, you see this under the um, core conditions that Nicole described earlier. You see this connect strategies and program outcomes in the text. And here it is. So strategies are the approaches, or, or if you want to think about them as sort of buckets or categories of activities that lead you towards your outcomes. And if you can answer questions about where you're focusing your efforts, that can help you identify the type of outcome that you want to achieve and also how you can track those outcomes. So for a proposal, an evaluation, a quality improvement plan, a training, a strategic plan. There's so many different ways to use this. And of course, in these sessions, we're thinking mainly about proposals, but those also proposals reflect other work. So um, these we hope will be relevant to, to this broader um, set of purposes. So in this tool, we've pre-populated some strategies that are focused on people, on organizations and systems, on places and communities, and on public and political will. So if you click on any one of these, you'll get a potential menu. Just showing one here under people. And you, this will give you some ideas of some possible strategies to consider. You may have others. And you may want to combine some of these in different ways. So these are just examples of the kinds of things that might fall into these categories. And then if you keep going under the outcomes section, which is divided into shorter term outcomes and intermediate outcomes, this will also give you some ideas about the types of changes that you could assign some metrics to or um, figure out some data to support these. So for example, you might want to be achieving some changes in awareness or knowledge in people's attitudes or beliefs or their skills to achieve some kind of change. And these are the kinds of measures that would tell you that. Is there some percentage change or increase um, in, in any of these things? And those are typically shorter term outcomes. So they're, they're closer to our current time frame. But the reason that you're doing all that work might be to achieve these intermediate outcomes that are harder to achieve. So they're the precursors to changes in behavior or status, like changes in health status. And these are some of the measures that might be in place for that. So this is just a good, um, tool to help stimulate some thinking about what are some categories of activities and strategies and what are some outcomes that might be associated with those. If you're stuck, you might want to try these, or if you want to expand what you've already got or, or rethink what you've already got in place, this can be another tool for that. Another tool we wanted to review with you today is called the Core Continuum of Results and Evidence. And this is also available through the same core page on DataShare. And this tool is also available in English or in Spanish. 
And it's aligned with a database of promising practices on data share. So it shows some parameters for um, projects or programs or initiatives that are just emerging, meaning they haven't been fully evaluated yet. Then there are things that are good ideas. So they may have some informal evaluation that shows an early sign of progress. They may be an effective practice, which means that there has been some formal evaluation showing at least one positive outcome. And then there are evidence-based practices that have been the subject of some more formal and rigorous evaluation that shows a, a statistically significant improvement in one or more outcomes. I really wanna emphasize that this is a continuum, meaning that there aren't values assigned to these, that one is better than the others. Evidence-based practices or EBPs all started out as emerging or good ideas that then got expanded and tested and refined over time. And so this is just an, a tool to have clarity about where you are in this continuum and what the implications of that are. So if you scroll down through the tool, you can see that there are some opportunities to look at the types of data that are gathered, whether that might be some forms or um, case studies, interviews, focus groups, and you can see that they get progressively um, more uh, formal as you go along, but they're all useful. And then you can also see the types of results or evidence that might be generated for you know, public use. So is somebody trying to emulate your program? If you're looking for something that you wanna try, you might wanna have more information about it rather than less. Um, what kinds of questions might you be asking yourself as you're looking at this program? Is it that, for example, for an emerging program, you've tried something, you don't think um, the usual approaches available to you are, are solving the issue, and you're just wondering, what if we tried something else? What, what can we do that hasn't been done before? So you are the person that, or the group that's trying to expand the universe of what's possible here. Or maybe you got something in the good idea category that um, seems to be working, but you want to know more about, could it, could it be better? Could it reach more people? Um, how would we know that? How could we improve what we're doing? in some dimension. So all of these are just different ways to think about what you already know about what you're doing and what might be useful to know as you um, continue implementing your program, either expanding it or strengthening it or maintaining it where it is. And again, all of these have some metrics associated with them and it can help you generate um, and describe, generate metrics and indicators and also describe your program to potential funders, as well as internally or, or with board members or other audiences. And again, this is also available in the same document in Spanish. And then just because we have a few minutes, I wanted to also share that um, Smarty Goal Worksheet to show you what that looks like. And we'll do some more detailed training about this as well, but just so you can see it. Here are the uh, words that and concepts that go with the acronym as we described earlier. But this worksheet, which is we also have available for you in Spanish, um, there's the example we went over but it helps you even in sort of a, a mad libs or a fill in the blanks fashion, um, it helps you try to write a sample goal with some prompts to fill in. And then it prompts you on how to think about adding equity and inclusion into um, an existing goal if that's not already there. So we just thought this was a really nice streamlined way to um, to work on, on goals and incorporate some of the 
elements that are very common uh, among funders and required in many, many kinds of proposals. Okay. We have time now for some um, questions from all of you. And maybe you have a question about what's been presented or are there particular challenges related to uh, metrics that you've faced in the past or anticipate in uh, measuring your activities and your outcomes and your impact? Or maybe you have a secret process for putting dinner on the table every night that you'd like to share? Or maybe there's a step that you're inspired to take from this material, something you'll, you'll try to do differently or do next. It's all fair game, we're here. Um, we'd love to hear your questions or comments or any ways that um, this material might be useful in the future, or things you want us to go into more detail about. Have we put you all back to sleep? No, it's very helpful. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. <laughs> Did you have a question or just? I don't think so. Not okay. Not right now. Okay. Thanks for thanks for coming off camera and letting us know someone's out there. <laughs> I just had to eat breakfast slash lunch at the same time. So <laughs> got it. We we know that feeling well. Thank you. Hi, Elaine. Did you have a question? No, I didn't. I'm I, my other meeting ran over, so I'm, I'll look for the recording and oh, then I'll great. email you if you have any questions. That sounds great. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. for being here. Thank you. Thank you both. Anybody else? I'm curious and interested if anyone is willing to share. Um, how many of you have things like a logic model or theory of change that you've created for your programs? That's something that you um already have in place or is that a step that you could see yourself doing as part of your program planning or proposal planning the next time there's a, a grant opportunity that comes up Kayla I saw you come off camera did you want to say something about that um hi everybody I'm Kayla um and I think logic models are really interesting. I think something that is challenging is definitely crossing the hurdle between a true, um, like what is a true outcome and directly associating a true outcome. It's really hard to do without any sort of like clinical study, which takes considerable resources. So I think, you know, working with those kind of like imperfect studies and acknowledging those unknowns is challenging, but, um, but it's something that I think our organization is looking towards in, in the future, but it, recognizing that that can be a challenge um, with uh, recognizing uh, we're not in a closed system, so. Yeah, that's a great point. Just, just the process of thinking about what do we know? What would we like to know? How would we ever know that can be really instructive too. And as Nicole mentioned, when we get to the point where we're offering specific training and technical assistance related to the core investments request for proposals and that application period, uh, we'll, one of the trainings that we do is specifically on developing a theory of change and logic model. Uh, so we'll have some more kind of concrete steps and ways of thinking about how do you, because sometimes it's about kind of figuring out, okay, do I think of that as a short-term outcome versus intermediate versus longer term. And, and then if it's a longer term and you're like, well, we think we contribute to this or, or ultimately, or ideally, this is what we would be contributing to, but we can't prove that, right? That we can't prove that causation. Then, then it becomes just a matter of how do you describe that to a funder so you're not like over promising or over, you know, or, or, or saying that you will definitively be the, the program that changes this. And so sometimes it's just a matter of like figuring out where you place it in your logic model. Um, and if you feel like, well, I can't measure this, 
with, you know, um, with certainty, I can measure this thing that is closer to the time that the service or intervention is provided. And even if that's a shift in knowledge or a change in intention to do a bit a, a different behavior or action, sometimes that's all you can measure if you're not going to, you know, because sometimes it's just not realistic or feasible to be, to be able to measure did an actual behavior or health status change, you know, over time. And so yeah. that's, you know, we, we're, we're big believers in the value of doing a theory of change and a log logic model, just so that within an organization, you're all, you can, it's, it's also a chance to, to check with other colleagues. Are we all on the same page and, and the way we think about this and how we talk about it? Um, and then it can help you think about, again, what's realistic to measure and how do you describe that in your proposals? Yeah, it's, it's a really good point that sometimes, you know, the, the value of a theory of change is clarifying your assumptions because they may or may not be shared. It's just so tempting to think, oh, well, this is really obvious to everybody else because it's obvious to me, but that's not the case usually. And, and I think often, you know, working with people on theories of change and logic models, as Nicole said, what we're doing is actually uh, narrowing, you know, trying to ratchet back expectations instead of expanding um, because that that are in the smart and smarty goals the realistic part is really important um, both you know internally to not get frustrated that you're not achieving what you had thought you might but also i think a lot of funders appreciate when you're realistic about what you can accomplish and have a are able to communicate that you know what's what you know the landscape you know what your resources and capacity are you know the areas that you can contribute to best um, and demonstrate, you know, competence and um, effectiveness that way as well. So thanks for the comment and question. Any others? Are, is, are SMART goals pretty familiar to all of you? Is that something you've had to incorporate into proposals before. How about the added IE, the SMARTY goals? Is that? Yeah, I was gonna say that I, I we haven't worked with that. So that was really great to, um, to learn about today. Important, of course. Oh, great, I'm glad. Yeah, I, I think that has a lot of promise for just reminding all of us that those are measurable dimensions and to um, to think about incorporating them in throughout um, our work, not just an add on here or there, but just it really does shape the way you think about what you're doing, the resources that are allocated to different things, the way you know, who, who gets um, included in conversations and decisions and all, all of that good stuff. So, um, and it's, it's very nice that those letters align with an acronym. Nicole, would you mind sharing what IE goals mean? Oh, sure. Let me actually go back to the slide, Elaine. And Thank you. Um, it's to include um, inclusion and equity. Oh. And so here's here's the example we went over um, a little earlier. So um, a lot of proposals and funders and plans, strategic plans and other plans talk about SMART goals, specific, measurable, either at achievable or aspirational, depending, uh, realistic and time bound. And the IE adds um, inclusion and equity. So in this example, the perfectly fine SMART goal was to build this volunteer team of 100 door-to-door -door canvassers by May. So that's got the S, the M, the A, the R, and the T. But adding the I and the E meant that they changed the goal to be um, with at least 10 people of color recruited as volunteer leaders first so they can help shape the way the organization runs its canvases. And so that's both the, the metric of inclusion and equity, but also um, a very specific purpose to, to change, to, to get that input 
early on and to shape what they're doing. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that. That's, sure. that's awesome. Yeah. And it's, um, there's a worksheet that you'll see, um, we'll have a link to it and you'll see going out with the, um, with the video and, um, and slides afterwards that will have the actual worksheet that walks you through doing that. But we can see a lot of potential for that in, in all of the work that we're familiar with here. Oh, thanks, Nicole. There it is in the chat. And Giselle has put the actual worksheet there. So you'll you can see that. And again, we're hoping to do a more in-depth um, training specifically on how to write those goals with some hands-on practice. And we can um, work on how to fill out that worksheet because it's sometimes a little harder once you have to actually put some things into those blanks, but, but it is doable. And all of these things, theories of change, logic models, smart goals, smarty goals, um, they might take a few tries. And that's kind of part of the process as well, that you, in, in trying to fill them out and put things in little boxes, um, it can help you think about, oh, I forgot about this, or, oh, I really need to reframe how I'm thinking about that or I really need a different way of describing the resources here or the steps, just like our making dinner example. Um, and you may have a way of achieving an outcome that is or is not the same as others. And that's also useful to know. Here's our unique contribution. Here's, mm -hmm. here's what we've learned in the past that, about how to deploy resources to achieve this, or here's why we're doing something that's different from the usual way of doing it. So that can be really useful too, if you're just trying to explain why you're doing what you're doing. And then I'm also curious if anyone's again, willing to share what, what kinds of challenges do you currently face or struggle with when it comes to either picking metrics or measuring them or like, what is it that led you to want to attend today's session? Because that'll also help us think about, yeah, upcoming. Yeah, Elaine. <laughs> so as an advocacy organization, right, like we don't build houses. And so I always get stuck, feel stuck on, you know, because everybody has, you know, their pretty numbers, their pretty graphs and all that stuff. And, and then I'm like, oh, well, I didn't build 100 houses in this amount of time and all that stuff. So how does one um, relate to funders as an advocacy organization um, to show that we're doing great work without having those numbers? Because I know it's I know it's gotta be possible because I, I, the two other organizations in the Bay Area that are similar to ours, one's been around for 40 years, so something's working. Um, so yeah, that's been my struggle these last, since I've taken on this role. Elaine, this is the um, part of the worksheet that we went over, um, the strategies and outcomes mm -hmm. on the core um, page on data share. It's the public and political will mm -hmm. section um, that we didn't go over. We had a different example with, um, with people, but mm. there's some of the kinds of things that lead to advocacy changes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can think about them as the steps that lead to yes. the change. So where can I get that? That's a gold mine right there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, I like that. I need it's that. The, it's this on oh. um, the strategies and program outcomes on data share. It's part of the core local progress page, which is one of the under one of the tabs right here. Okay. Yes, and we, we went over it, um, you, you may have missed it before you came on, but we just, um, mm. the, the whole point of this is to mm -hmm. link strategies to outcomes. Yes. And just to give you some some language and some ideas. So this isn't the whole universe of things. Mm -hmm. Your um, organization may have some different ones. Mm -hmm. but you can see they're listed under people, 
There's a set that are most relevant to organizations and systems or places and communities. And the one I just shared um, that probably has the most relevance um, to advocacy is this one under public and political will. Mm -hmm. um, so just a, a, a starting point. And then Elaine, you mentioned there's another organization in the Bay Area that's been around for 40 years and is yes. doing similar work. Looking at what other organizations measure um, and, okay. um, and the Promising Practices database on data share is a great place to start there as well. Okay. But a lot of people are generous and about including their instruments um, for mm -hmm. what they measure, their frameworks or approaches or their theories of change and logic model. Mm -hmm. And using those as starting points, especially when you acknowledge where they came from, mm -hmm. um, and that they contributed to yours is, is I think, uh, a fine practice as well. Not always necessary to reinvent the wheel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, I'm so glad I jumped on this call. It's good information. <laughs> if I can add to that, um, again, not to sound like a broken record, but that's where a theory of change and logic model can be really useful because, and then it goes hand in hand with using that strategy and outcomes menu. Because mm -hmm. if you think about, for instance, if you're doing an advocacy campaign mm -hmm. and you're kind of going through the exercise of a theory of change and logic model, you're thinking through, okay, well, what is it that we're trying to do right. by doing that advocacy campaign? What is it that we're trying to... So some of the things you saw um, on the website just a moment ago, some of them represent activities, right? These are the mm -hmm. ways that you would do advocacy. And for each one of those, you could measure like, okay, how much of that did we do? Like how many mm -hmm. email campaigns, how many one-on-one -on -one meetings, how many, you know, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't necessarily have to have like an outcome for each one of those activities. But if you think about, okay, taken together, like if we do all these advocacy activities, what are we hoping comes out of it? Mm -hmm. And what do we think is measurable? Um, if you have ways of measuring like public sentiment or kind of public opinion about the mm -hmm. issue that in some ways is kind of gold. Like if you're able to get a sense of like, what is public opinion before or mm. after you are implementing an advocacy campaign, or if your ultimate goal is to uh, get a, a, a policy passed, whether it's by, you know, a local elected body or a state body, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes those are, I mean, that's hard. It can take years, right, for that change. But that that could potentially be a longer term outcome. But then you could also think about, okay, is there any in between? Like, what else might tell us that there are, again, shifts in awareness, knowledge, beliefs, you know, willingness to act on whatever the issue is that you're um, fo focusing your advocacy campaign on? And it, you know, it is true that it's some, it takes a different way of thinking about metrics. And sometimes when you're putting it into a proposal, it's just as much about using that as basically like an educational opportunity for <laughs> funders and for reviewers about um, when something is not a direct service, how, that, you know, that it's still valuable still necessary here's how you measure change and it can lead to more direct services because mm -hmm. it creates um, a different environment and climate yeah exactly i i think for policy change in particular i'm thinking about like public health lens from tobacco control and other policy initiatives um part of the education that nicole mentioned for for funders is it's not just about whether the policy gets enacted or not that's so hard and it takes so long, but all of the steps that lead up to a policy change can still change hearts and minds and services, even if a policy itself doesn't change. So for example, in tobacco control, it's really hard to change retail practices about selling tobacco to minors, for example. Um, so you may have an effort to not have those retailers near schools and it may get shut down every time you go before a city council because they don't want to alienate businesses and they want the tax revenue. But the process of doing that has generated media coverage. Maybe you've got a city council member who switched sides, even though all of them didn't. 
maybe you have a retail or a group of retailers who've decided that they want to step up and not sell cigarettes to minors. So they have their own group. There's so many things that could be a result of your efforts and ultimately contribute to some of those changes, but aren't the policy itself. And thank you both. That's fantastic. Um, so thinking back to the logic models and um, some of those kinds of things you might be thinking about as the short or intermediate outcomes that are um, not the ultimate impact that you're trying to achieve, but are still worth pursuing and doing. So that's the case that you're making, that um, whether we achieve this ultimate goal or not, we are still creating change in the direction that we want and hope for. And we can measure that. Um, thanks for those great questions that gave us a chance to um, amplify some of the points earlier. Let's share a couple of resources before we disperse. And feel free to keep asking questions. We'll, we'll hang out for a few minutes too. Um, So as you've seen, there are some um, items on the core local progress page, some tools. Um, Giselle is putting these links in the chat so to make it easier to get to those. So we went over two, two of those tools today, the um, strategies and outcomes tool that has all of those menus to choose from. And then we also went over the um, continuum of results and evidence that has um, a dual purpose for evaluation and metrics and can help you clarify where your program is or wants to be. The Smarty Goals worksheet we went over is available from this link. Um, we, are we are gonna send you that as well with our follow-up email and you'll have it available in Spanish. And that's one that we'll do some more training on um, coming up but that just might be a good place to start to, to uh, think about how your own goals could, could translate or transform into SMARTY goals. And then the National Collaborative on Childhood Obesity Research has an evaluation toolkit that has some really nice examples of process measures and outcome measures and how to think about them. So that's just another, it may not be your exact um, field or issue, but it has some really nice examples that are probably um, ready for adaptation to, to whatever you're working on. So just check that out as well for some inspiration. Um, let's see. Nicole, do you want to describe these last few events? Sure. We have some things coming up in May, which I guess is this month. Um, we have a couple what we call core peer learning circles on May 8th and May 23rd. These are hosted by our colleagues, Jane Conklin and Crystal Caballero. So actually neither Nicole or I will be there. And peer learning circles are just more informal than even the core coffee chats. Um, there is a, a theme or a topic for each one. These are all centered around evaluation but it's really just an opportunity, almost like office hours. If you have questions around, in this case, data collection and analysis, uh, then sign up to attend the Peer Learning Circle on May 8th. You'll get a little bit of uh, content and some suggested resources from Jane, um, who is a, an evaluation guru. That is uh, what she specializes in. And then she'll facilitate a discussion to, to have the group talk about any questions that um, participants have around data collection analysis, like, you know, how do you go, how do you decide what to collect? How do you develop the right tools? What do you do with the data when you have it? And so the conversation will really be driven by whoever attends and what questions and ideas and insights that they uh, contribute. So that's the format for both May 8th and May 23rd. On May 28th, we're going to do another one of our joint workshops with DataShare Santa Cruz County, where we're going to, again, pick a topic, but really use DataShare and kind of demonstrate how not only community level data in general, but data that's on DataShare can be used 
or planning and advocacy and evaluation. On the May 28th session, we're going to focus specifically on using data in DataShare for public policy and equity. And we'll actually get to see a, an example in a recently released report from the Santa Cruz County Women's Commission that used data on DataShare. So those are events coming up. We encourage you to register for those and also share your feedback with us about today's uh, today's event. We always look at the comments and the feedback. It helps us think about uh, what worked well, but also what we can do to continuously improve and make sure that both the content and resources that we share are helpful and relevant to you. So you can either, if you're uh, looking at the screen, you can scan the QR code if you have a smartphone with a, a camera app, or you can click the links that Gisela posted in the chat. And once you click the links, they'll take you to a SurveyMonkey page and uh, you can fill that out at any time. You don't have to stay in the Zoom meeting to do that. And I also just wanted to add that next week when our core newsletter comes out, which I hope you're all receiving, um, we will have a link to a survey about all of these offerings, the, the core Institute learning arm umbrella that Nicole described earlier. And so we really encourage you, I, I know everybody has survey fatigue, but we really encourage you to um, give us feedback on what you've taken from these sessions, what you'd like to see in the future, how you use the information. It's really, really helpful to us. And we hope you'll spend a few minutes doing that when it comes out next week. So I think that is it for today. Just wanna to thank everyone for joining us and we hope to see you at these upcoming events. And thanks to Stella and Gisela for the interpretation and translation. And we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.